In this podcast, we will be delving into the fascinating world of slime mold. Slime mold is a type of single-celled organism that can exist as both individual cells and a multicellular organism, depending on environmental conditions. Despite their simple appearance, these organisms have captivated scientists for decades due to their remarkable capabilities and behaviors. In fact, slime molds have been shown to exhibit complex problem-solving abilities, spatial awareness, and memory formation. This have made them a valuable model organism for research in fields ranging from biology and ecology to computer science and design. In this section, we will explore the different types, their life cycle, and the behavior and capabilities that make them so unique. By the end of this podcast, we hope to leave you with a greater appreciation for these fascinating organisms and the potential they hold for scientific discovery and innovation. Let us begin with brief history and background of research. Slime molds are a diverse group of organisms that have captured the attention of scientists due to their unique properties and abilities. They are found in various habitats, ranging from forests and meadows to ponds and damp soil. They have been the subject of research for centuries, with some of the earliest records of slime mold observation dating back to ancient Greece. The first known description of slime mold can be traced back to the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, who described an organism that appeared to be a plant during its growth stage but moved like an animal during its reproductive stage. However, it wasn't until the 17th century that slime mold began to be studied more systematically. In the late 1,600 seconds, Antony van Leeuwenhoek, a Dutch scientist and inventor, was the first to observe and describe slime mold under a microscope. He named the organism animalcules, which were later identified as slime molds. In the 19th century, the famous German naturalist Ernst Haeckel observed and documented the life cycle of molds, including their growth, reproduction, and spore dispersal. He also recognized their importance in the ecosystem, noting that they play a crucial role in decomposing organic matter and recycling nutrients in the soil. It wasn't until the 20th century that scientists began to explore the unique properties and abilities of slime mold more closely. In 1928, the British biologist Kenneth Raper published a comprehensive study of Dictyostelium discoideum, a type of slime mold that exhibits complex social behavior during its reproductive stage. In the 1970s and 1980s, researchers began to investigate the problem-solving abilities of slime molds. The Japanese researcher Toshiyuki Nakagaki discovered that Physarum polycephalum, a type of slime mold, could navigate mazes and find the shortest path between two points, despite lacking a nervous system or a brain. This groundbreaking discovery led to a renewed interest in the research, with scientists investigating the unique properties and abilities of these organisms from a variety of perspectives. Today, scientists continue to explore the many mysteries of slime molds, uncovering new information about their behavior, capabilities, and potential applications. One of the most exciting areas of current research is bio-inspired computing and optimization. Scientists are studying the problem-solving abilities of slime molds in order to develop new algorithms and computing methods that can be used to solve complex problems, such as traffic optimization or data analysis. Slime molds have also inspired artists and designers who have used their unique shapes and patterns to create sculptures, textiles, and other works of art. Additionally, they have been the subject of ecological research, with scientists investigating their role in the ecosystem and their potential as indicators of environmental health. Despite the many discoveries and advancements in the research, there are still many challenges and limitations to studying these fascinating organisms. One of the biggest challenges is the lack of knowledge about the genetic mechanisms that underlie their behavior and abilities. Additionally, ethical considerations must be taken into account when conducting research on living organisms. What in this world do we study slime molds? 
The study may seem like a niche area of research, but in fact, it has great potential for a wide range of applications and discoveries. Slime molds are a group of organisms that are often overlooked, yet they possess remarkable abilities that make them fascinating subjects of study. From their problem-solving skills to their ecological significance, the importance of studying slime mold cannot be overstated. One of the key reasons why studying slime mold is important is its potential for bio-inspired computing and optimization. It has been shown to be capable of solving complex problems such as the shortest path between two points or the most efficient transportation network. This ability has attracted the attention of researchers in computer science and engineering, who are looking for ways to harness this natural intelligence to develop better algorithms and optimization strategies. In fact, one of the most interesting aspects is its capacity for self-organization and emergent behavior. Slime molds are composed of thousands of individual cells that work together to form a single organism. This collective behavior has been compared to that of a neural network, where each cell acts as a neuron that communicates with its neighbors to create a larger, more complex system. The study thus provides a unique opportunity to explore the principles of self-organization and emergent behavior, which have broad implications for fields such as robotics, artificial intelligence, and complex systems. Moreover, slime mold also offers unique opportunities for ecological research. As decomposers and soil organisms, slime molds play an important role in nutrient cycling and soil health. They are also important indicators of ecosystem health, as they are sensitive to changes in their environment and can act as early warning systems for environmental disturbances. By studying them, researchers can gain valuable insights into the complex relationships between organisms and their environments, which is crucial for developing effective strategies for conservation and sustainable resource management. In addition to its scientific applications, the study of slime molds also has artistic and design possibilities. The intricate patterns and structures created by slime molds have inspired artists, and designers to create new forms and structures that can be applied to architecture, fashion, and product design. These creative applications have opened up new possibilities for interdisciplinary collaborations between science, art, and design. Despite its many advantages, this also presents significant challenges and limitations. One of the main challenges is the lack of knowledge about the genetic mechanisms that underlie slime mold behavior. Unlike other model organisms such as fruit flies or mice, the genetics of slime molds are not well understood, which makes it difficult to manipulate their behavior or to develop genetic tools for research. This limitation underscores the need for more research into the genetics and molecular biology of slime molds, which will require significant investment and resources. Another limitation of slime mold research is the ethical considerations surrounding the use of live organisms in research. While slime molds are generally considered to be non-sentient and non-suffering organisms, their use in experiments raises important ethical questions about the treatment of living creatures. As such, it is important for researchers to consider the ethical implications of their work and to develop responsible and humane protocols for studying slime molds. Despite these challenges, the study of slime molds offers great promise for scientific discovery and innovation. As researchers continue to explore the remarkable abilities of these organisms, they will undoubtedly uncover new insights into the principles of self-organization, emergent behavior, and computation. These discoveries will have far-reaching implications for fields such as artificial intelligence, complex systems, and sustainable resource management. Furthermore, the interdisciplinary nature of slime mold research means that it offers exciting opportunities for collaboration between science, art, and design, which will lead to new creative applications and insights. Let's talk about types of slime mold. Slime mold is a fascinating organism that has captured the attention of scientists 
and enthusiasts alike for decades. There are many different types of slime mold, each with their own unique characteristics and behaviors. In this section, we will be discussing two of the most well-known types of slime mold, Physarum polycephalum and Dictyostelium discoideum. Physarum polycephalum also known as the many-headed slime mold, is a bright yellow unicellular organism that is commonly found in moist, shaded areas such as decaying leaves and logs. It is known for its impressive problem-solving abilities and has been the focus of many studies on emergent behavior and self-organization. Despite its unicellular nature, Physarum polycephalum can form complex and dynamic networks that allow it to solve mazes, find the shortest path between two points, and even make decisions about its environment. Dictyostelium discoideum, on the other hand, is a social slime mold that spends most of its life cycle as separate cells that move and feed independently. However, when conditions become unfavorable, these cells come together to form a multicellular organism that is capable of coordinated movement and spore dispersal. It has been studied extensively for its unique ability to sense and respond to chemical signals, which allows it to navigate through complex environments and find food sources. First, the Physarum polycephalum. It is a single-celled organism that is a type of slime mold. It is commonly referred to as the many-headed slime or the brain of slime molds due to its unique and complex behavior. It is found in damp, decaying vegetation and is often used in laboratory studies to investigate the properties of living organisms. It has a simple yet fascinating life cycle. It begins as a spore, which grows into a single-celled organism known as a plasmodium. The plasmodium consists of a single, large, multinucleate cell that can grow up to several centimeters in length. The plasmodium feeds on bacteria and other microorganisms in its environment, absorbing nutrients through its cell membrane. As the plasmodium grows, it branches out into a network of thin, vein-like structures called protoplasmic tubes. These tubes are filled with a viscous cytoplasm that can flow in different directions, allowing the organism to change shape and move around its environment. Despite being a single cell, Physarum can display complex behaviors such as navigation, problem-solving, and memory formation. One of the most remarkable capabilities of polycephalum is its ability to solve complex problems. In laboratory experiments, the organism has been shown to find the shortest path between two points, even when presented with obstacles or multiple pathways. This behavior is known as the slime mold algorithm, and it has been studied by computer scientists and engineers as a potential model for optimization and routing problems. If you need in-depth analysis for the algorithm, make sure to comment it down below. By the time you do that I must have attached a link to the same in the description below. Have fun! Coming back, Physarum has also been observed to display an innate sense of spatial awareness. In experiments where the organism is placed in a maze-like environment, it can navigate to the most nutrient-rich areas without making any wrong turns. This ability is thought to be due to the organism's ability to sense and respond to the chemical gradients present in its environment. Another fascinating property is its ability to form and retain memories. In laboratory experiments, the organism has been trained to associate different stimuli with specific responses. For example, it can learn to associate light with the presence of food and dark with the absence of food. This type of associative learning is thought to be mediated by changes in the organism's cytoskeleton and gene expression. Beyond its scientific applications, polycephalum has also been used in art and design. The organism's complex patterns and growth behaviors have inspired artists and designers to create sculptures, installations, and even clothing. Some designers have also explored the use of physarum as a living material, capable of adapting and changing over time. However, despite its many fascinating properties, there are still many challenges and limitations to studying it. One of the main challenges is the lack of knowledge about its genetic mechanisms. While the organism's genome has been sequenced, there is still much to learn about how its genes interact to produce its complex behaviors. 
Additionally, there are ethical considerations when working with living organisms, particularly when conducting experiments that involve manipulation or harm. Next on the list is Dictyostelium discoideum. Dictyostelium discoideum, also known as dicty, is a species of slime mold that has been widely studied for its unique characteristics and behaviors. Dictyostelium discoideum belongs to the group of cellular slime molds and is known for its ability to transition from a single cell amoeba to a multicellular organism. In this section, we will explore the life cycle, behaviors, and research applications of Dictyostelium discoideum. The life cycle. The life cycle of Dictyo begins with the vegetative stage, where the organism exists as a single cell amoeba. The amoebas feed on bacteria and reproduce through mitosis. When food is scarce, the amoebas aggregate together to form a multicellular slug like structure. During this process, the amoebas differentiate into two types of cells, prestoc cells, which form the front of the slug, and prespore cells, which form the rear of the slug. The slug-like structure moves towards light, where it forms a fruiting body that consists of a stalk and spores. The spores are dispersed, and the life cycle of Dicti begins again. Basic Behaviors Dicti has several unique behaviors that have made it a popular model organism in the fields of cell biology, developmental biology, and microbiology. It is known for its chemotactic ability, which allows it to navigate towards chemicals in its environment. It uses this ability to find food sources and to aggregate during the multicellular stage of its life cycle. Dicti also has phototactic behavior, meaning it moves towards light, which is an important factor in the formation of its fruiting body. Another unique behavior is its ability to form biofilms. Biofilms are communities of microorganisms that grow on surfaces and are held together by a matrix of extracellular polymeric substances. Dicti can form biofilms on surfaces such as rocks and leaves, and this behavior has been studied for its potential applications in bioremediation and wastewater treatment. Finally, the research applications. It has a wide range of research applications, including in the fields of cell biology, developmental biology, microbiology, and biotechnology. Its ability to transition from a single cell organism to a multicellular organism has made it a popular model organism for studying cell differentiation and cell-cell communication. Dicti has also been used to study the effects of drugs and toxins on cells, as well as the mechanisms of cell death. Because it is an eukaryotic organism, it can be used as a model to study human diseases and cellular processes. In biotechnology, it has been used to study and develop new drugs and antibiotics. One example of this is the development of a compound called parthenolide, which was found to have anti-inflammatory properties and was originally isolated from the plant feverfew. Parthenolide was tested on Dicti and found to have potential as an anti-cancer drug. Finally, it has been used in the development of bio-inspired robots and computing systems. Researchers have used the chemotactic and phototactic behaviors of Dicti to develop robots that can navigate towards chemicals and light sources. These robots have potential applications in areas such as environmental monitoring and search and rescue operations. Now let us talk about life cycle of any slime mold. It has, broadly speaking, three major stages. In this section, we'll be exploring the life cycle of slime molds, and we'll start by looking at the plasmodium stage. Slime molds are unique organisms that belong to the kingdom Protista. They have a complex life cycle that includes multiple stages, each with its own distinct characteristics. The plasmodium stage is the most recognizable stage of the slime mold's life cycle, and it's what most people think of when they hear the term slime mold. So, what, really, is the plasmodium stage? The plasmodium is a large, multinucleate, an amoeboid mass that is formed when individual cells of the slime mold come together. During this stage, the slime mold is a single, giant cell that can grow to be several centimeters in size, and it can take on various shapes and colors depending on the species. One we just talked about, Physarum polycephalum 
which is often used in research due to its unique properties. When it is in the plasmodium stage, it appears as a bright yellow, web-like mass that can move and engulf food particles. But how does the plasmodium stage come about? The plasmodium is formed when individual cells of the slime mold, known as myxamoebae, come together through a process called aggregation. This aggregation is triggered by various factors, such as the presence of nutrients, moisture, and light. Once the myxamoebae have aggregated, they fuse together to form a single, large cell with multiple nuclei. The plasmodium then begins to move and search for food, which it engulfs through phagocytosis. The plasmodium's movement is driven by the pulsation of its cytoplasm, which allows it to move in a direction where it can find more food. During the this stage, the slime mold can grow to be quite large. In fact, some species can grow to be several meters in length, making them one of the largest single cells in the world. Despite its large size, the plasmodium stage is actually quite vulnerable to environmental changes, such as changes in temperature, humidity, and light. In order to survive, the slime mold must constantly move and search for favorable conditions. This movement is aided by the slime mold's ability to sense and respond to environmental cues. For example, if they encounter a bright light source, it will move away from it and towards a darker area where it can continue to grow and feed. This ability to sense and respond to its environment is just one of the many fascinating properties of slime molds. Another interesting aspect of the stage is the slime mold's ability to fuse with other plasmodia. When two plasmodia come into contact, they can fuse together to form a larger, more complex organism. This process is called plasmodial fusion, and it allows the slime mold to expand its range and increase its chances of survival. This fusion can also lead to the formation of fruiting bodies, which we'll explore in more detail in a later episode. These fruiting bodies are responsible for the production and dispersal of spores, which are the reproductive cells of the slime mold. But for now, let's focus on the plasmodium stage. One of the most remarkable properties is its ability to learn and remember. Despite lacking a nervous system, the slime mold is able to navigate through complex environments and remember the locations of food sources. This was demonstrated in a famous experiment where Physarum was able to solve a maze by creating the most efficient route to the food source without ever having been through the maze before. This stage can last anywhere from several hours to several days, depending on the species and environmental conditions. As the mold grows and feeds, it will eventually reach a point where it needs to transition to the next stage of its life cycle. This transition is marked by the formation of fruiting bodies, which we'll discuss in more detail in a later episode. The formation of fruiting bodies is a crucial part of the slime mold's life cycle, as it allows for the dispersal of spores and the continuation of the species. Next stage of its life cycle is called fruiting body stage. I really wonder why. The fruiting body stage begins when the plasmodium, which has been growing and feeding on organic matter, reaches a certain size. It then undergoes a transformation in which it stops moving and begins to form a stalk structure, which will eventually produce spores. This transformation is initiated by the production of a chemical called cyclic amp, which signals to the plasmodium to begin aggregating. As it aggregates, it forms a mound-like structure, which is called a slug. The slug is a collective entity made up of many individual cells, which coordinate their movements to form a cohesive structure. The slug then begins to migrate towards a suitable location for spore dispersal, such as a piece of wood or a leaf. As the slug moves towards its destination, it undergoes a process called differentiation, in which the cells in the front of the slug become specialized to form the fruiting body, while the cells at the back remain undifferentiated. Once the slug reaches its destination, it stops moving and the cells at the front of the slug begin to form the stalk of the fruiting body, while the cells at the back form the spores. The stalk is composed of elongated cells that lift the spore-bearing structure above the surface of the substrate. The spores are held within a protective casing, called the sporangium, which is situated at the top of the stalk. 
The sporangium is designed to protect the spores from environmental factors such as wind, rain, and sunlight. As the sporangium matures, it begins to dry out and eventually ruptures, releasing the spores into the air. The spores are then carried by the wind or other means to new locations, where they can grow and form new plasmodia, starting the life cycle anew. The fruiting body stage of a slime mold's life cycle is an important aspect of its reproductive strategy, allowing it to disperse its spores over a wider area and increase its chances of survival. It also provides researchers with a unique opportunity to study the behavior and coordination of individual cells within a collective entity. However, there are still many unanswered questions about the mechanisms behind the differentiation and coordination of cells within the slug and the fruiting body. Future research in this area could provide valuable insights into the development and behavior of multicellular organisms. And finally, we have the spore dispersal stage. As the fruiting body develops, it gradually dries out and turns brown. Eventually, it bursts open, releasing spores into the environment. The spores are carried away by air currents, water, or animals, and can travel long distances before settling in a new location. So, why is spore dispersal such an important part of the slime mold life cycle? Well, for starters, it ensures the survival and continuation of the species. The spores are the reproductive cells of the slime mold and are responsible for initiating the next generation. But the process of spore dispersal is not as simple as it sounds. There are many factors that influence the success of spore dispersal, such as environmental conditions, competition from other organisms, and the genetic makeup of the slime mold itself. One of the most interesting aspects of spore dispersal is the variety of mechanisms that slime molds use to achieve it. Some molds, such as Physarum, release their spores into the air and rely on wind currents to carry them away. Others, like Dicti, release their spores into water and rely on water currents to disperse them. Another fascinating mechanism used by some molds is the creation of slime trails that lead from the fruiting body to a new location. These trails are made up of a sticky substance that the spores can cling to as they move away from the parent organism. This method is particularly effective for slime molds that live in humid environments, as the slime trails can remain moist and sticky for longer periods of time. It's worth noting that the success of spore dispersal also depends on the availability of suitable habitat for the spores to grow and develop into new organisms. This is why slime molds have evolved to produce such a large number of spores. It increases the likelihood that at least some of them will find a suitable environment in which to grow. In addition to ensuring the continuation of the species, spore dispersal also plays an important role in the ecology of the environment. As the spores travel through the air or water, they can encounter a variety of other organisms and environmental conditions. Some may land in areas that are already inhabited by other molds or bacteria, leading to competition for resources. Others may land in areas that are rich in nutrients, providing an ideal environment for growth and reproduction. Now, let's discuss about behavior and capabilities of slime mold. Despite being a single-celled organism without a brain, it exhibits complex behaviors that are often compared to those of higher organisms, including problem-solving, navigation, and memory formation. These abilities have captured the attention of researchers from various fields and have led to numerous studies investigating the underlying mechanisms and potential applications. One of the most impressive feats of slime mold is its problem-solving abilities. Studies have shown that it can navigate mazes, find the shortest path between two points, and even solve mathematical problems. These abilities are due to the organism's ability to adapt and learn from its environment. They can also navigate their environment using a process called chemotaxis, where they move towards or away from chemical gradients. This behavior enables them to find food and avoid harmful substances. Another intriguing capability of slime mold is its ability to form memories. Researchers have found that it can learn to associate certain stimuli with specific outcomes, and can recall these associations even after prolonged periods of time. 
This ability to learn and remember information without a central nervous system is a subject of ongoing research. In this section, we will delve deeper into the fascinating behaviors and capabilities of slime mold, exploring the latest research findings and potential applications of this remarkable organism. First, the problem-solving abilities. When it comes to problem solving, slime molds are surprisingly adept at finding solutions to complex challenges. One of the most famous examples of this is the slime mold's ability to navigate mazes and find the most efficient route from one point to another. In one experiment, researchers created a maze made of agar and placed the mold in the starting position. They then placed food sources at two different points in the maze and observed how the slime mold moved. Within a few hours, the slime mold had explored the entire maze and had found the shortest path between the two food sources. This ability to solve mazes may seem relatively simple, but it is an impressive feat for an organism that lacks a central nervous system. It demonstrates that slime molds are capable of processing and integrating information in a way that allows them to make complex decisions. Another impressive example is their ability to create efficient transport networks. In nature, slime molds use their plasmodium stage to grow and spread, forming networks of veins that allow nutrients and other essential resources to be transported throughout their body. Researchers have also found that molds can optimize these networks in a way that minimizes the energy required for transportation. In one experiment, a team of scientists created a map of the Tokyo area and placed pieces of food at various locations. They then placed a slime mold on the map and observed how it spread out to consume the food. Within a few hours, the slime had created a network of veins that covered the entire map, with the thickest veins connecting the food sources. What was particularly impressive about this network was that it closely resembled the existing rail network in Tokyo, suggesting that the slime mold had optimized its transport network in a similar way to human engineers. Molds have also been used to solve other types of optimization problems, such as the traveling salesman problem. This is a well-known problem in mathematics and computer science that involves finding the shortest route that visits a set of cities and returns to the starting point. While this problem is difficult for computers to solve, slime molds can solve it surprisingly quickly. In one experiment, researchers placed oat flakes at various points on a map, representing different cities. They then placed a slime mold in the center of the map and observed how it spread out to consume the food. Within a few hours, the slime mold had created a network of veins that closely resembled the optimal route for visiting all of the food sources and returning to the starting point. These examples demonstrate that slime molds are capable of solving complex problems in a way that is efficient and effective. But how do they do it? What is it about their biology that allows them to make these decisions? One theory is that slime molds use a decentralized decision-making process known as emergent computation. This is a process by which simple individual behaviors combine to produce complex collective behavior. In the case of slime molds, each individual cell is capable of sensing and responding to its environment, allowing it to move towards sources of food and away from harmful stimuli. When these individual behaviors are combined across the entire network of cells, it produces a coordinated response that allows the slime mold to solve complex problems. This decentralized approach to decision-making has some interesting implications for computer science and artificial intelligence. Many researchers are now exploring the potential of swarm intelligence, which is the idea that complex problems can be solved by groups of simple, decentralized agents that interact with each other. Molds are just one example of how swarm intelligence can be used to solve problems, but they offer a particularly interesting case study due to their biological complexity and flexibility. Navigation and Spatial Awareness Now, let's delve deeper into the remarkable behavior when it comes to navigation and spatial awareness. Despite lacking a nervous system or a brain, slime mold has shown an impressive ability to navigate through complex environments and find the shortest route to food sources. 
One of the most notable examples of slime mold's navigation skills was demonstrated in a 2010 study led by Toshiyuki Nakagaki from Hokkaido University in Japan. We have already talked about what the researchers observed was nothing short of astonishing. The slime mold extended its pseudopodia, or tentacle-like projections, towards the food sources and gradually formed a network of protoplasmic tubes that connected all the stations. Within a few hours, the slime mold had established the shortest possible routes between the food sources, almost exactly reproducing the existing rail system. The implications of this study are significant. Molds had shown the ability to efficiently and accurately solve a complex problem that is mathematically equivalent to finding the shortest path through a maze. This ability to solve optimization problems quickly and efficiently has sparked interest among scientists in developing bio-inspired computing and optimization methods based on slime mold's behavior. But how does slime mold navigate through its environment without eyes or a nervous system? One possible explanation is that it relies on chemical and tactile cues to orient itself and move towards food sources. Slime secretes a variety of chemicals that serve as attractants or repellents, allowing it to detect and respond to changes in its environment. It can also sense gradients of light, temperature, and humidity, which may help it orient itself towards food sources. Another explanation is that it uses a distributed system of information processing to make decisions about where to move. Rather than relying on a centralized control system like a brain, mold's behavior is the result of the interactions between thousands of individual cells. Each cell can sense its local environment and respond to changes by extending or retracting its pseudopodia. By communicating with neighboring cells, slime mold can coordinate its movements and navigate through its environment as a collective. It's also worth noting that slime mold's ability to navigate through complex environments is not limited to two dimensions. In a 2018 study led by Audrey Dussutur from Paul Sabatier University in France, the researchers placed Physarum in a three-dimensional maze made of gelatin cubes. The slime mold was able to navigate through the maze and find the food source at the center by extending its pseudopodia in all directions and forming a network of protoplasmic tubes that connected the cubes. This ability to navigate through three-dimensional environments is particularly impressive, as it requires a higher degree of spatial awareness and coordination than two-dimensional navigation. Mold's behavior in three dimensions could have important implications for robotics and artificial intelligence, as it provides a model for decentralized control and distributed information processing. So, what can we learn from the navigation and spatial awareness? One possible takeaway is that complex problems can be solved by distributed systems without the need for a centralized control system. Slime's behavior suggests that efficient and optimal solutions can emerge from the interactions between individual agents, even without explicit communication or coordination. Another takeaway is that natural systems can inspire new approaches to engineering and design. The remarkable abilities of slime mold could inspire new methods for decentralized control and distributed decision-making in robotics, artificial intelligence, and other fields. Furthermore, the study of navigation and spatial awareness could have implications for ecology and environmental science. Mold's ability to navigate through complex environments and efficiently find food sources could provide insights into the behavior of other organisms, such as fungi, bacteria, and even animals. By studying how it interacts with its environment and makes decisions about where to move, scientists could gain a better understanding of how organisms adapt to changing conditions and survive in different habitats. However, there are still many unanswered questions about the behavior and capabilities. For example, scientists have yet to fully understand the genetic mechanisms underlying mold's problem-solving abilities and spatial awareness. Additionally, ethical considerations must be taken into account when conducting research on living organisms. Despite these challenges, the study has opened up new avenues of research and provided insights into the complex and fascinating world of living organisms. 
let's dig deep into memory formation in them. The ability of mold to form and retrieve memories is another area of interest for scientists. Despite lacking a nervous system, slime mold has shown the ability to learn from its environment and use this information to make decisions about where to move and how to respond to stimuli. Talking a lot about slime reminds me of an anime. Can you name it? Parts to the comments who get it right. Coming back to the example of this is the slime mold's ability to remember the location of food sources. When slime mold encounters a food source, it leaves behind a trail of pheromones that other slime mold cells can follow. If the food source is depleted, they will eventually stop leaving the pheromone trail. However, if the food source is reintroduced at a later time, the mold will quickly retrace its previous path and begin leaving the pheromone trail again. This ability to form and retrieve memories without a nervous system is a fascinating area of research that could have implications for neuroscience and artificial intelligence. By studying the mechanisms underlying memory formation in them, scientists may gain insights into how memories are formed in other organisms, including humans. Furthermore, the study of memory formation could inspire new approaches to machine learning and artificial intelligence. By developing algorithms that mimic the way slime mold learns and adapts to its environment, scientists could create more efficient and adaptable systems for data analysis and decision-making. However, there is still much we do not understand about it in retrieval processes. Scientists are still trying to unravel the genetic and molecular mechanisms underlying these processes and determine how they are influenced by environmental factors. Let us talk about the applications and uses of slime mold. We will explore some of the exciting applications and uses of slime mold, ranging from bio-inspired computing to art and design. One of the most promising areas is its potential for bio-inspired computing and optimization. Slime has been shown to solve complex problems and optimize solutions in a way that resembles human intelligence, making it an attractive model for artificial intelligence and machine learning. Scientists are studying how mold uses its network of protoplasmic tubes to efficiently transport nutrients and communicate with other parts of its body, and applying these principles to develop more efficient algorithms and networks. It is also being used in art and design, with artists and designers incorporating its unique patterns and forms into their work. Mold can be grown in controlled environments to create intricate and organic shapes, which can then be used to inspire new designs in architecture, fashion, and product design. Finally, slime is also being studied in ecological research, as it plays a critical role in nutrient cycling and decomposition in ecosystems. By understanding the behavior and interactions of slime mold in natural environments, Scientists can gain insights into the broader functioning of ecosystems and the impacts of environmental change. Let us look into it one by one in some depth. First, bio-inspired computing and optimization. It is an exciting field of research that has emerged in recent years, inspired by the remarkable abilities of living organisms. In this section of the podcast, we will explore how researchers have turned to these organisms for inspiration to create new computational methods that can solve complex problems more efficiently. Slime molds have long fascinated scientists due to their ability to solve complex problems, such as finding the shortest path between food sources despite not having a brain or central nervous system. In the past few decades, researchers have used slime molds as a model for creating new computational methods and algorithms that can solve problems in a range of fields, from transportation and logistics to medicine and engineering. One of the most prominent examples of this is the creation of the slime mold algorithm, which is used to optimize transportation networks. In this algorithm, researchers modeled the growth of slime mold to determine the most efficient routes for transportation networks, such as roads or rail systems. By mapping the growth patterns of slime mold, they were able to create a computer algorithm that could optimize transportation routes to minimize travel time and distance. 
This has also led to the development of other bio-inspired algorithms, such as ant colony optimization and particle swarm optimization. These algorithms are based on the behavior of ants and flocks of birds, respectively, and have been used to solve a range of optimization problems, such as scheduling, routing, and resource allocation. If you want to know about them in details, do comment down below. Another area is in the field of image processing. Researchers have used the ability of molds to create efficient and adaptive networks to create new image processing algorithms that can better handle noisy or incomplete images. By mimicking the growth patterns, these algorithms are able to identify and fill in missing data points in an image, resulting in clearer and more accurate images. In addition to transportation and image processing, researchers have also looked for inspiration in the field of robotics. Molds are known for their ability to adapt and navigate through complex environments, and researchers have used this as a model for creating robots that can operate in challenging environments, such as disaster zones or space exploration. By mimicking the behavior, these robots can move in a flexible and adaptive manner, navigating around obstacles and adapting to changing conditions. By mimicking living organisms, these methods can find solutions that are more adaptive and robust, and can often solve problems that are too complex for traditional computing methods. This has led to the development of new and innovative solutions in a range of fields, from transportation and logistics to medicine, and engineering. However, there are also challenges and limitations in applying bio-inspired computing and optimization to real-world problems. One of the key challenges is in the development of accurate models of biological systems, such as slime molds. While researchers have made significant progress in understanding the behavior of these organisms, there is still much we do not know about the underlying mechanisms and processes that drive their behavior. It's just pattern analysis so far. And now let's talk about art and design. Art and design may not be the first areas that come to mind when one thinks of mold research, but this fascinating organism has proven to be a source of inspiration for many artists and designers. The unique patterns and shapes that emerge from slime mold growth can be aesthetically striking and can also provide insight into the behavior and capabilities of this fascinating organism. One example of the use of slime mold in art is the work of Heather Barnett, an artist and researcher who uses Physarum polycephalum to create intricate and beautiful designs. Barnett has been fascinated by slime mold for years and has explored its growth patterns in various artistic projects. In one installation, called the Physarum Experiments, she created a series of Petri dishes filled with agar, a nutrient-rich gel that is ideal for mold growth. She then placed small pieces of food in different locations on the agar and watched as the mold grew and spread, creating intricate and unique patterns in the process. Barnett's work with slime has also led to collaborations with other artists and designers. For example, she worked with architect Shota Tsikalia to create a 3D printed model of a building based on the growth patterns of mold. The resulting structure, called protocell architecture, was inspired by the way molds form networks to optimize their growth and survival. Another artist who has been inspired is Eduardo Kak, a pioneer in the field of bioart. Kak has used Dictyostelium discoidium in his art, exploring themes such as communication and collaboration between organisms. In one project, called Communicator, Kak created a device that allowed him to communicate with Dictyostelium cells using light and sound. The project was meant to highlight the ways in which different species can interact and communicate with each other. In addition to inspiring art and design, it has also been used in various practical applications. One example is the work of engineer Andrew Adamatsky, who has used Fisarm to create computer circuits. You bet. I am going to make a detailed video on this topic for sure. Make sure to subscribe to never miss any episode.
Slime mold is particularly well suited for this application because it is able to form complex networks that can be used to transmit signals. By placing electrodes on the mold and using different stimuli to control its growth, Adamatsky has been able to create circuits that perform simple computations. Another practical application in the field of materials science. Researchers have found that slime can be used to create a type of self-healing material. The mold is mixed with a polymer solution and then allowed to dry, forming a solid material. When the material is damaged, the slime is able to grow and repair the damage, making the material more durable and resilient. Ecological Research One of the key areas where molds have been used in ecological research is in studying nutrient cycling. It is the process by which nutrients, such as nitrogen and phosphorus, are cycled through ecosystems. This process is critical for maintaining the health and productivity of ecosystems. Slimes have been found to play an important role in nutrient cycling by breaking down dead plant material and releasing nutrients back into the soil. Studies have shown that molds are particularly efficient at breaking down tough plant materials such as lignin which is a major component of wood. In fact, some species of molds have been found to break down lignin more efficiently than many fungi. This ability makes them an important component of the ecosystem, as they help to release nutrients that would otherwise remain locked up in dead plant material. They have also been found to be important in the formation of soil crusts. Soil crusts are important for preventing erosion and retaining moisture in arid environments. Molds have been found to play a key role in the formation of these crusts by producing a type of glue that binds soil particles together. This glue helps to create a stable surface that is resistant to erosion and helps to retain moisture in the soil. In addition to their role in nutrient cycling and soil crust formation, they have also been found to play an important role in the regulation of microbial communities. Microbial communities are complex networks of microorganisms that interact with one another and the environment. These communities are critical for maintaining the health and productivity of ecosystems. Molds have been found to regulate microbial communities by feeding on certain species of bacteria, and fungi. This helps to maintain a balance between different species and prevent any one species from dominating the ecosystem. One example of the role is in the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the area of soil that surrounds plant roots. It is home to a complex network of microorganisms that interact with plant roots to help facilitate nutrient uptake. Molds have been found to play an important role in regulating the microbial communities in the rhizosphere by feeding on certain species of bacteria and fungi. This helps to maintain a balance between different species and prevent any one species from dominating the ecosystem. Another area where slime molds have been found to be useful in ecological research is in the study of invasive species. Invasive species are species that are introduced to an ecosystem where they do not naturally occur. These species can have a significant impact on the native ecosystem by outcompeting native species and altering the nutrient cycling and other ecosystem processes. Slime molds have been found to be useful in studying the impact of invasive species by providing a way to measure changes in the microbial communities and nutrient cycling processes. For example, in a study published in the journal Biological Invasions, researchers used slime molds to study the impact of the invasive plant species, Japanese knotweed, on the microbial communities and soil. The study found that Japanese knotweed had a significant impact on the microbial communities in soil, leading to a decrease in the diversity of bacteria and fungi. This had a ripple effect on nutrient cycling, as certain species of bacteria and fungi were no longer present to break down certain nutrients. In addition to the above areas, they have also been found to be useful in studying a variety of other ecological phenomena. For example, they have been used to study the impact of climate change on ecosystems, as well as the role of biodiversity in ecosystem stability. Molds have also been found to be useful in studying the impact of pollutants on ecosystems.
For example, in a study published in the journal Chemosphere, researchers used slime molds to study the impact of heavy metal pollutants on soil ecosystems. The study found that heavy metal pollutants had a significant impact on the microbial communities in soil, leading to a decrease in diversity and activity. Make sure to subscribe the channel to never miss an update. Next episode is on protozoans. Now, we see the challenges and limitations in studying slime mold. In this section of the podcast, we will explore some of the challenges and limitations that researchers face when studying slime mold. While they have fascinating properties and capabilities, there are still many mysteries surrounding their genetics and behavior. As with any field of research, ethical considerations also play a role in studying mold. We will discuss some of these challenges, including the difficulty in isolating specific genetic mechanisms. Despite the challenges, there is still much to be learned about these intriguing organisms and the potential benefits they may offer. First, we deal with lack of knowledge about genetic mechanisms. One of the major challenges in studying slime mold genetics is the complexity of their genomes. The genome of Physarum polycephalum, for example, is estimated to contain approximately 34,000 genes, which is more than the human genome. This large number of genes makes it difficult to identify which genes are responsible for specific traits or behaviors. In addition to their complex genomes, molds also have unusual genetic mechanisms that are not found in other organisms. For example, Physarum has 13 different mating types, each of which can only mate with specific other types. The genes responsible for determining mating type in Physarum have been identified, but the mechanisms behind the actual mating process are still very poorly understood. Another challenge in studying genetics is the lack of genetic tools available for these organisms. Many standard techniques, such as CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, are not yet applicable to 